Oh yeah. Oh yeah, this is good stuff. I'm really liking what I'm seeing here. Got a fresh package from Mr. Landscaper. That's my favorite company for drip supplies. The stuff that they sell is just sturdy. These are new and improved. I should start. Hey, what's up, Garden Friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great. Just going. Taking off right from the get-go. Haven't really thought, as per usual, much about this week's vlog. Just started recording. So I'm getting ready to do something out here. And I had mentioned in the video where I set up the new drip line that runs from down here, the one that I rigged into my irrigation lines that uh, I wanted to do some expanding and I needed some adapters. Mainly these things right here. Some nice drip sticks, not sticks, stakes for micro irrigation. They're just, they're, these are so good. And uh, I haven't been able to find them at Lowe's, which is where they used to sell them. So I was bulk ordering them. You can see them, they're under the table here. You see what's going on? I'm trying to get one out for you. So these have all I've been able to get a hold of, which are okay, but no, they're not okay. Actually, I don't like them. There are a lot of problems with these. One, the hosing on this, it's rigid and stiff. It's gonna crack if it spends the winter outside in the elements, that's annoying. The head on here is one that just fits specifically to these micro sprayers. So these came with a 180 heads. So that's all you can use them for. They're adjustable, which is nice. And uh, they're also, anno well, I guess I should say another annoying thing about them is that the way they're set up is they have this loop in them and you have to cut this tape and pull it through. And because the hose is so rigid, it's hard to get that to pull through without bending the line. I don't like them. These over here, these ones from Mr. Landscape, look at that nice, flexible, soft tubing. They have right here, here we go a flow restrictor or regulator really that punches in nicely into your half inch line and an open just hole so you can put whatever type of spray head you want on these things it's just so much better and they're also adjustable and there's a collar this right here you detach that collar and you put it up here before you put your spray head on so much nicer than those other junky ones the thing that i'm really excited about <laughs> so nerdy the really excited about drip stuff, but it is it's exciting. New things excite me. These are the new adjust adjustable adjustable drip stakes. So typically what I've been using are ones that I was just bulk buying, like this one right here. And this is what the ones they sell looked like, but they didn't have a red top on them. They have holes in the top. And you can adjust them. Generally they go from zero to ten gallons per hour and they put out a spray with you know a big circle spray. Problem with these all of them, all the ones I've ever tried, is that over time they can get loose, the tops on these get loose, and then they blow off. And then you just have a geyser of water that shoots up, you lose a lot of water pressure, and you gotta replace the heads. It happens with a lot of mine, sometimes up to like twice a year. And these really cheap ones, from I don't, just some random company on Amazon, they make a really loud whistling sound when you use them. I do not like these. Mr. Landscaper has come out with a new adjustable dripper stake. So it's the same idea, top spins and everything, but they lock and they've made them longer. The locking part is what I'm really the most excited about. So when you take them up, when you open them up all the way, that's, you can't turn it anymore. So that top doesn't come off like it does on the other ones. You turn it down, goes down really far, turn it back up, goes up really far, but it's not going to give you a blow off. It'll stay put right on there. And it's an American company, a uh, USA company. So that's always nice to support local and small businesses. Uh, small, I mean, they're vendoring, vendoring, is that the word? Supplying Lowe's. So that's pretty nice. And that's, it's a big contract form, but uh, the Lowe's around here, they just stop selling the bulk of their stuff. They have some stuff, but I didn't see these there. I haven't been able to find these recently so that's why I placed an order and the main thing that I really wanted was some more quarter inch tubing in some different colors so here is a hundred feet of quarter inch tan vinyl tubing and then I have another hundred feet of quarter inch white vinyl tubing here the reason I wanted this is so that I can run the drip across the patio to those pots down on the other end of the pool where the hydrangeas are we have a heat spell a heat front coming through hot from warm front that's the word my brain i'm sorry just finish up with everything for last week's video and it was a long one so i'm still recovering my ram's low right now 
supposed to get really hot. That's the whole point. And this would be a good time to go ahead and run a line from that new drip lines that I set up to those containers. And now I have tubing that will go across the patio. And this is sort of a, I, well, I, just, I don't really know how to describe it. I don't know if going with tubing that you can't see across the patio is the best move because you can't see it. So kind of a tripping hazard. But aesthetically, I think it'll be a lot better. People just need to watch their steps. Also, the pressure is so much better through this new drip line that I have set up, the main line that everything runs off of, that instead of doing what I used to do in the past, which is where I would have three of these per big container, I'm just going to do one, zero to 10 gallons per hour. That should be plenty of water for those two containers, or at least enough water to supplement. And when it's really hot, if they look like they could use more than I can go in and water by hand, but it won't take me anywhere near as long to water them by hand because they'll be getting some supplemental water. You get it? It, it makes sense in my head. So now the question is, do I use white or tan? I'm thinking... They'll both be somewhat noticeable. They're not going to stand out that much. I don't want it to blend in too much. Like I said, it'll be a tripping hazard. <laughs> sounds stupid. I feel like the white's just, it's going to show a lot of dirt. Maybe the beige would be better. Not really sure. I think the beige is fine. I don't want to put too much thought into this. Either one of these is going to be fine. Like I, said, I don't want to blend in too much, but I want it to not be just a piece of black tubing that runs across the patio. I think we'll go with the tan. Tan's probably the way to do it. I think that will blend in nicely. Sorry, fan. I just tripped myself over there. Oh, and now I'm in the sun and can't see my screen. Okay, so the trick with this is going to be to run the line from the shortest distance possible. So this one, I'm gonna run diagonally across here. And now it's gonna look junky, but it's gonna save me so much time with watering that I don't even care. I think, where did I run the bang line? It's back here somewhere. Isn't it? It should be. Oh, it's right there. That'll be easy to tap into. And this one's gonna have a further distance to go. This one's gotta come down, go all the way across and back up to the behind everything in that berm. If there's enough water pressure, I don't think that there should be any issues. Okay, so first thing I gotta do is find the end. Where's the end of the line? Gonna need that to get this thing started. These tend to be coiled up kinda funkily. That should be good. It's such nice thick tubing and it's still flexible. I love that. That can be harder to find. Oftentimes the tubing, when it's flexible, can be thin and not useless. I don't think that's the way to say it, but it just tends to not last as long. And the elements, the tubing ends up getting really hard and crunchy, springs, leaks. This will do that too, but it takes longer. We get a few more years out of this before that starts to happen. Okay, now where did that go? Over here. I'm gonna just try and punch this in. This is the punch tool. Right around up here. Don't have to be too terribly precise with it. Just need to make sure that the hole is punched on top. <laughs> Sometimes end up doing it on the bottom by accident. That's good. Okay, take this piece right here. There is a tool you can use that snaps on to this end. You can use it to punch it in but this is a new line a new half inch line so it should pop in there fairly well on its own yeah give it a little tug make sure it's in there sorry about the bad camera work there I'm working at an odd angle here I don't want to be able to pull it out there we, that's good and then I'm going to try and pull this out this way maybe I should have done this from the other side of the Alexander palm that's well, too late now it's all springy and coiled up. That's normal. The heat that will relax. So I may have accidentally end up cutting too much on here, making it too long. I mean, it, the less lined, the better. Always want to keep it at the minimum because that's how you preserve water pressure. <laughs> Do you see him? I can't see my screen. Where'd you go? There he goes. That little Hummer was just flying around like six inches in front of my face. Looked like he wanted to do something. I don't think he was happy about me being over here right next to his pack of stackies and hydrangea. Okay, so the only issue when you have something planted in the front of the container is that that means that there's going to be a spot where the water is blocked. So I want to make sure that I get this, I think more in the, well, maybe over here. So this is why I usually use two drippers because everything that's on the other side of this trunk right here, it, the spray's not going to hit it, but I don't think I have anything planted directly across from here, so that should be fine. All right, irrigation is on. 
Oh yeah, look at that. That's a nice big spread. That's gonna get this entire container with the exception of just these few little things over here. But I'm thinking that with these running at max capacity, I'm gonna push down a little bit further. Don't want it to spray out of the pot. I think that'll be good. That should do it. I did this one off camera. You got the point with the first one, right? And I think I needed to go in and show you all the second one. Yeah, that's such good pressure. That should keep these nice and hydrated. I think that just one per pot should be fine. But, well, we're going to find out. It's going to take a few days. And especially when that heat gets here, we're really good to see how well it works. Okay, that was all. <laughs> Not all. There will be more things happening in the video. Watch your step here, Turbo. Got a curly tube. But it's Saturday, and Saturday's video just came out, so I need to pay attention to that. Reply to comments and, you know, do weekend things. We'll pick up later and do some yard work, pot some stuff up, maybe hit up a nursery. I don't know. No idea what's going to happen. Got the ewes planted. <laughs> All of them. It's a week later. I may have put something up on the screen indicating that. I don't know, but it's a week later and 50 degrees cooler. It's like 64 right now. It feels so good. A little bit chilly, actually, but uh, it's still supposed to be getting up into the 80s during the daytime. I thought I should seize the opportunity to go ahead and get the shrubs in the ground since it's not you know unbelievably hot outside i could have filmed the process but it was kind of a just want to get it done sort of situation that in my neighbor's house is directly behind me i feel so weird talking to the camera right now because i know that they might be in the windows they might be watching me not the case i'm sure they have better things to do with their life but i wanted to show what everything looks like so i did three these are hilly i use and they have more of an upright appearance I think the hilly eyes go six to eight high and like three to four feet wide. So a nice plant for making a little hedge. I started right here, went right here, and then I stopped off to a big gap because there's an evergreen, this viburnum right here. I originally had them laid out in a straight line, which I'm sure that would look fine, right? But it just didn't make sense. We've got this evergreen right here to put a row of evergreens right behind them that you're not gonna be able to see. So I did the other three over here. There's one that you can't really see over there. Another one right here. And then the other one right here. So there's two groups of three. And uh, I think that that actually looks better since it's going to be a long time until they can grow together. It looks more, I guess, intentional unless it's like, oh, there's a straight line of plants that <laughs> are way too small and look funny and awkward that and I'm not going to be allowing these to get all that big you know these are just here for some evergreen interest to add a little bit of privacy they're not going to add much but just a little bit of privacy and uh, something to just kind of block the view of the fence but I don't want them to get so big that they're going to shade the front of this garden bed here either so I got all these impatiens this acanthus which has been doing great I'd like to be able to do more with plants in the front of this bed and if I do let these get really big and if I had planted them close enough to form a really strong hedge, like a nice straight line hedge, then I wouldn't be able to plant basically anything <laughs> in front of them because there's just not much sun on the front of the bed. A lot of it comes through at the front in the springtime, but then in the fall, it's a lot of afternoon sun that comes from behind everything. So I think this works out. One, two, three, little gap. One, two, three, and eventually I'm gonna take them all the way down behind this pine tree and down the hill that way. You were a good helper, weren't you, Turbo? No, you weren't. No, you weren't. I was tripping over him the entire time. The entire time I was tripping over him. So much has actually happened since I set up the drip on those hydrangeas down there. And I suppose you should probably, you, you want to see them? You, I should probably talk about those. We're moving on to other things. So that was just over a week ago, something like that, maybe eight days. And as you know, with everything I said in that portion of the video, I was trying to get the drip set up on these guys before the heat came in and protect this one from the sun. That worked out really well. I don't know, it's moving it to the shade, that's about as much as you can do. Keep them hydrated and out of the sun. I don't understand it. Talk about this in the garden tour. It, this never used to happen. This is a new problem. Heat's not a new problem. Triple digit temperatures happen quite frequently in fact i think there's been less of it this year than most years but the last two years this one's just been turned into a crispy mess when it gets up into those triple digit temps 
I don't understand it. So my thinking was that it's probably time to go ahead and pull these in the springtime, that is late winter, spring, pull them out, give them the prune that they would always get. Panical hydrangeas. just want to cut them back so that they're not just too much for you and you end up having more leaf tips, more branching, I should say, and therefore more flowers on them when it's time to bloom. But while I'm doing that, also go ahead and give it a root prune and get them back to these containers. The perennials, they can only be in containers for so many years, about three years is usually when you start to have problems. These making containers for like, I don't know, 10. Probably not 10, I don't know. They were down there where those Miami planters were in different containers, much smaller containers than those two containers for probably four years, I'm guessing. Maybe four or five years, that's how long those were over here. And then the trees grew and there was too much shade, it just wasn't working. And I got tired of trying to make sure there were palms and all these pots around the pool. It was too much every year. I wanted some perennials, so I moved them over here and they've been doing great up until we get the triple digit temps. And this one's fine, nothing wrong with it and it's getting more sun than that one was getting during the heat because, you know, I moved this into a lot of shade. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. The only thing I can think is that I need to give it a root prune and start it over, which isn't a big deal. Something should probably... Did I just say something? <laughs> I think I did. Something that should probably be done every three years anyway. So, yeah, do that in the springtime. And I guess we'll find out next year if that makes any kind of a difference. We'll see. But the whole point there, though, isn't necessarily that this happened, that the drip didn't really have much to do with saving that from happening, other than just keeping them hydrated. You can tell that I'm, my brain's like scrambled. It's been a very busy morning. I need to slow it down, gather my thoughts so that I'm not stuttering and stumbling all over the place. I did not have to water these at all. So we had that, what? eight day stretch of being around triple digit temperatures, they did fine. So one drip head per pot with that nice pressure and the good quality drip heads, the multi pronged heads. It's been over a week, it's hard for me to remember. Yeah, I just did one of them, right? Per container. They did great. Other than, you know, the browning, but that I don't think has anything to do with the drip because at no point did they look dehydrated. They never wilted down. So I just think that that was just, it is too dang hot for them. But I'm glad that I didn't have to water over here. That saved so much time with those types of temperatures to be able to focus on just watering everything on that end of the patio and everything else down here. I checked on it, and uh, I think there were a couple of occasions that I came down here with the hose and gave a few plants some extra water, but otherwise it was pretty much just sustained by the drip, which is exactly what I wanted. Probably saved me 40 minutes to an hour of watering at this point, not having to come down here with the hose. That's been so nice. So, so, so nice. And then I had a new irrigation company come out here that I haven't tried before to change out some heads and do some things. And they did a great job. Got a new head put in over here that it's, right now it's not really running. It's on low pressure because I have a line split off of this that's running into the pool to auto top off. But when it's going full blast, now everything over here is getting water and everything over there is getting water. The chestnut did not like the heat. It's very unhappy. It'll be okay though just falling to pieces. <laughs> Everything's a mess. Uh, looks like the heat did take out one of the arbs. It happens. They're very old. I've suspected that this might be a thing that starts to happen over the next few years with some of the ones that are closer towards the patio that aren't getting as much sun from the maple tree being up here. But that's all right. That's what arbs do. That's why those were double layered. So there's a layer in front of them and a layer behind them. Uh, and also some of this is just the chestnut. This is a buckeye, actually. I shouldn't be calling it a chestnut. It's called the Fort McNair chestnut, but it's a buckeye. And this buckeye <laughs> is, uh, I think, responding to the swing in temperatures because I say that because the one up here on the hill is doing the same thing, where it's starting to yellow up like it thinks it's fall, which, I mean, I can't really blame them. It's like I said yesterday, it was 50 degrees cooler than it was just a few days prior. Cooler. Jeez. I need to turn my brain off because I wish that there was a restart button from a mouse. You get what I'm saying. The swings and the shifts and pretty dramatic changes with all the temperatures. It has some of the plants just kind of going, hey, what the hell's going on? And then Toby had three vet appointments last week. Had his final appointment yesterday. Got his stitches out. 12 days. 12 days. That's so fast. Cannot believe how quickly the dog heals. Especially at 14 years old. He's doing great. He's getting around like a puppy. He is pooping everywhere though. 
there's some valve control issues that you're going to need to be paying attention to, but I think that that's probably just some discomfort still. Is, you know what I'm talking about? He has six pound tumor lipoma removed, and that's, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty big thing to go through at any point in life, especially when you're 14, but his recovery has just been fantastic. And now I have plants. Oh, and the, the plumber, the sewage situation. <laughs> Another update. I think this is the last one. So this is all stuff that was going on last week. The dog, multiple vet visits, irrigation company was out here doing a lot of stuff. Oh, and they put a new head over here too. Nothing right here was getting water, or at least not much water, because the head was only coming up about this high, and that's all burned up really high. So it was just blasting water into the soil. It was doing nothing. So they came in and put in a 12-inch uh, riser, so the water's now getting somewhat in there. Everything's blocked by the sun patients. So, you know, what can you do? But it's an improvement. It's saving me a lot of time not having to go over there and water. The sewer. Talked about this a couple weeks ago. We had an incident in the basement where it's like the, you know, the drain that's in the ground. If you have a basement and if you have HVAC down there, then there's a drain in the ground. And it, it burped. There was sewage everywhere. And I thought, okay, well, this is bad, but got it cleaned up and didn't happen again. And consensus seemed to be that somebody down the line probably ran a pressure test and that's what made it happen. Well, a few days later, the smell was back and went down there and it had done it again, but there wasn't sewage this time. And when I say sewage, it was like pipe bile. Like it wasn't fecal stuff. It was just like really stinky, gross, gooey rust clumps, basically. It didn't do that the next time. It was just a ring of water. And I was like, okay, well, that's not good. But it went back down, it drained down. And then a few days later, it did it again. So got a plumber out here. They were here for like 10 minutes. This <laughs> is like $245, 10 minutes worth of work. And it was just uh, something was backed up. They said probably from the kitchen sink. The house is 30 years old, so that's just happens sometimes, apparently. I don't know. Problem solved, though. And uh, now I have plants. There are so many plants. <laughs> <laughs> so much to catch up on, I'm so sorry. And uh, these guys over here, which I think I talked about during the garden tour. The vichias, they're flushing out nicely. I pulled them over here where they can get a little bit more sun. I think maybe should give them another week before I move them. I'm not sure. The air is really dry this time of year, so I don't want to stress them too much by moving them into a spot with a lot of sun when there's no humidity. So maybe, I don't know. I'm going to give it till the end of the weekend and make sure that they're still looking good. Because this one, the foliage on it started to lighten up quite a bit. It looks beautiful though, doesn't it? Like it's, it's not supposed to look like that, unless it is and it's variegated, but I'm pretty sure it's not. I'm pretty sure that's just the plant struggling. It's on the struggle bus. <laughs> it should be a nice deep green. But if that were variegation, it would be quite pretty. And then I have all these plants over here from mostly plant delights, plants for the shade garden. I have my battery charging for my auger. It's a nice thing. Everything here is small enough that I can just pop the holes with the handheld auger. This should go very quickly. So I would like to get a lot of these put in the ground. Maybe today. I think that'd be a good thing to get done today. And look at this, the toad lily. It's got buds on it. Oh, that's exciting. They have the cutest flowers. I cannot wait to show those flowers. I put some pictures up on the screen when I was talking about them, but it just doesn't really do them justice. You gotta see them in person. Okay, now, plants. I have a few more. There's been a lot of unboxings lately. I think this should be the end of it for, I mean, I don't know, at least for a couple weeks. Okay, cooled the camera off. Think we should be good. It's just a thing now. I think it might be time for a new phone. The phone has always been my go-to during the summertime because I can't use my nice Sony out here when it's hot, but the summer, this thing's just been overheating like crazy. I think it might be time to move on to something new. Got a few, um, not impulse buys, but last minute I didn't know I wanted it till I saw it and then I got it buys. Don't judge me, you know you do it too. So here's what, I got on Etsy because I was trying to find the Musella Lazio Carpa. I had been talking about how I wanted to get one to plant into that new shade, part sun, part shade garden that I'm working on. You know, all those plants I just showed you before in the background. And, uh, when I did that, you know how they recommend things? Well, they popped up a little Musa Nono from the Green Escape, who I've ordered from plenty of times. And the price was really good because Labor Day weekend. So I said, okay, uh, uh, why not? I, I, I need another one because the one I have <laughs> is not, not very happy with me right now. I think it's going to be okay, but it's been through it. It has not enjoyed the triple digits and then the suddenly like upper 40, 50 degree 
night temperatures that we've been having over the last couple of weeks. And with Green Escape, you have to order two plants at a time. So I went through their entire listing. They have too many plants, <laughs> which I know is a crazy thing to say, but it was just so much. And I didn't want to just throw something in there that I didn't want. And I'm not all that into like the aeroids and things like that. I like them, but I have the ones that I like, put it that way. I don't want more. So I wanted to find something that I could use out here in the garden. So I got this Fatsia, Fatsia japonica. The variety is spider's web, so it's a variegated Fatsia. The price on this was good. On the no-no, good price, because they're a relatively newer cultivar. If we're going to call them a cultivar, that's debatable. $14.99, though, for this? Uh, I think that's kind of steep. You can generally find these. I don't see them at the nurseries that often, but when I do, they're usually in at least a one-gallon container, and they're $14.99 to maybe $44.99. The more they are, the bigger the container usually is. Like, the five-gallon ones are usually around $40, $50. Bucks. So that's, I just feel like $14.99 for something that's a starter plug kind of ridiculous if you ask me not everything is a great savings just because it's in a plug but uh i wanted the no no i wanted another one because i was worried about the one that i have it's not looking great so wanted to have a backup no no so i that's that's how that happened it wasn't planned but here we are and over here this is the musella lazio carpa and i had a box cutter until i turned the camera on and now I don't. Oh, here it is. It's over here. It's underneath my phone case. Musella is a banana that's all on its own. It's just the Lazio Carpa, at least that I'm aware of. There may have been some changes over the years, but pretty sure it's just the Lazio Carpa. It has a very unique growth habit to it compared to most other banana trees. They tend to form more of like a, I don't know how you describe it, maybe a banana bush. They, they get bushy. I'll put it up here on the screen if editing me can remember to do that. Here's the packaging. This is from Wellspring. Who, they send little plants. That's what you get with them. It was packaged fine, though. It had a stick in there to keep it from moving around too much. Little air pack. Looks like there's a guarantee and uh, maybe a planting guide. Like, what, it's talking about are your plants happy and healthy and what to look for, what to do with them. All good stuff to know. But it's not what we're here for. Water me now. I do like that. They just get straight to the point. Let people know, water this plant. <laughs> there are probably a fair amount of people who get plants and they're like, oh no, it looks terrible. <laughs> you do, first thing you need to do is water them, give them a nice drink, and that can make a big difference. This is a complicated twist tie. What's happening here? Oh, it's not. It just extends to the label. Haven't seen that before. It's kind of neat. So, so here it is. And this is actually a fairly good representation of what they look like, even though it's a tiny little baby. <laughs> this is, oh my gosh, this is stinking adorable. It would look even better if it didn't have a broken leaf, but that's just what happens with them when you ship them. Bananas get broken leaves. But they almost look like a small inset banana. Might be a good way to describe it. Very large and bulbous at the base and a, an extreme taper going up top. And they have very long leaves on them. And they form a really tight clump. So it, to me, like I think I said when I was talking about these in that video, they give me the vibe of like if you wanted it to look like a clump of the red bird of paradise then this is about the best you can do <laughs> probably the closest thing you're going to get to that in zone five and six they're rated as zone seven and up i have a good amount of experience growing the lazio carpas they are extremely cold hardy i would say as cold hardy if not more cold hardy than the baju the japanese fiber bananas i think that I already talked about, but we'll just do it again. It's fine. The ones I've had in the past, I kept in containers and I could leave those containers outside in the winter time. They would die back completely. But when spring came around and things got warmer again, they would come back up. And we have winters where we drop below zero on plenty of occasions. When plants are in containers, they're more exposed to things. It's not like it had protection from mulch or anything like that. I think that this is a long time ago, a very long time ago. I think that what I did with it was I tucked it back here in this corner there was a tiki bar and i would put it back there into the tiki bar so i guess it was somewhat protected but not very much and that thing grew like a champ it would die back and come back as a really big beautiful full plant every single year and they will usually flower for you they need at least like i think i want to say nine to ten months of growth 
and they put up a really beautiful bright yellow in fluorescence that just looks like a torpedo that shoots out of them. It's a good banana for flowering. Other good options for cold hardy bananas that might flower for you, uh, the Velotina and the Ornata. They don't have the big robust appearance of a lot of banana trees. They stay smaller, but they have a shorter cycle that they need in order to produce a flower. But this one's unique because it's basically a banana shrub. You're just gonna have a nice little bush of big strappy leaves of these. That's really stinking cute. Very, very, very much ready for a new container though, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I need to repot all three of these. I have some containers over here and some soil ready to be blended up in the gorilla cart. So I'm gonna think, yeah, I should do that. I also need to remember, I need to repot this but go oh, oh a tripod which what's wrong you having some issues this morning okay begonia here needs a repot and i think i'm just going to take it out of this container and repot it into this one right here and then i would also like to pot up the desmontiana agaves that i got in the plant delights hall and then start getting stuff in the ground over there in the shade garden so what i have oh great camera work i didn't even think to adjust the tripod and move it over to what i'm actually doing here we are, Gorilla Cart. Hopefully y'all can see this. The problem is over there, things overheat really fast. But over here, it's kind of hard to see. At least it's hard for me to see the screen. I bet it's probably not that bad once I have it up there for editing. In here, I have prepared a soil blend that I think should be good for just about everything, which you know, when you think about what I'm doing here, I'm potting up begonias, a fatsia, a banana, two bananas actually, and then these agaves, Typically, they would not like the same soil, but the principle here for everything is something that drains well. It can be organically rich. The tropical agaves, they'll be fine with that and holds on to some moisture. So I will be potting up the agaves last. That way I can add some more grit and stuff into here so that it will be a little bit more airy for them just to, you know, stage off any root rot or anything like that that may have to deal with. But for the most part, I think that this blend should be good. So what this is, is uh, I want to say probably 75% just all-purpose potting mix, it's miracle Grow, and then about 25% of the ocean forest. I've been doing this blend all summer and really liking the results that I've been having with it. The nice thing about the miracle Grow is, well, for one, it's much more affordable, and it is inoculated with fertilizers in there that help get things going nice and quickly, but you know, after probably three to six months, somewhere in there, that starts to wear off, and then at that point, all the good stuff that's in the ocean forest, which takes a lot longer to activate i guess you could say or really do its magic for the plants that will have started to do its thing because all those nice organics that are in there will start to break down and be providing nutrients for the plants or minerals for the most part not really nutrients for the plants so it's kind of like you get something to get them going off with and then something to help maintain them the ocean forest also i find it's a little bit better at holding on to <laughs> moisture so i'm distracted turbo's playing with a cicada he's not hurting it he's being very gentle Okay, cicada's gone, now he's playing with a fly. Good boy, you make a friend, Turbo? Did you make a friend? He's so good, such a, <laughs> such a good boy. And then I also have about, I'd say maybe two cups of very fine white sand in here to help with drainage. Wow, that's, that's maybe too close. <laughs> Back it up somewhat. And just a handful of small chipped lava stone. I don't know if you even be able to see it. So it's not too much, but I want there to be some grit in here for everything. I like for my potting mixes to have a good amount of texture. I think it just helps get things going better. It's more natural to have some texture if you're trying to mimic an organically rich forest floor. And a, a dose of the Mother Earth Farmer's Market, which is, it's like a powder, it's bat guano and all kinds of good stuff in it that you have in the ocean forest, but it's a lot cheaper to just use the powder and sprinkle it in there. So lots and lots of good stuff, going to drain well, Plants should enjoy it. That's uh, I think I spent too much time talking about soil. I'm sorry, I do that sometimes. I get excited about dirt. Go ahead and kick things off with the begonia since I already have its pot sitting right next to me. This is the double dot, I think is what it was called because it's got, it's, it's immaculata with a lot of spots and the spots are very vibrant. Very, very, what just flew out of the pot? A bug just flew out of here. Don't know what that was. I think it was a moth or something. It has been fairly vigorous, probably would have been more vigorous had I repotted it earlier in the season, but you know, sometimes you fall behind on things. It happens. This one 
has a nice pinkish undertone that's not quite as red as you see on the regular Maculata. I mean, you see that? It's really nice. I really enjoy the color on this begonia. And it's sturdy because, you know, it's a begonia. I figured that this potting blend should be good for it because it's rich, holds on to moisture, and drains well. It can be tricky sometimes when you're mixing up a bulk mix that you want to use on lots of plants, but not all those plants like the same conditions. But really, begonias and uh, the, uh, what else over there? Well, pretty much everything I was just talking about are plants that, as I mentioned, are going to enjoy a rich soil that drains well and holds on to some moisture, which is the exception of the agaves. Although, like I keep saying, they're tropical agaves. So I think that they'll be, we'll talk about that more, but I think they'll be fine when you get to that. Look at all those spots. Isn't that beautiful? I could have bumped this up into a larger container and it, that maybe I probably should have, but this is what I had that I think it looks cute. And so I went with this one. This is just, I went aesthetics over what would be best for the plant. And sometimes you can do that. It's okay. It's a begonia, right? If this were something more delicate, I wouldn't do that. You know, say if it were an aeroid or anything with roots that might stick to the inside of this container, I wouldn't even use this pot, but this should be good until the springtime, I would think. Probably get about another maybe 50% growth on here. If even, if I were to go even larger, should I put it in a bigger pot? Problem is I don't have a lot of small pottery. So I don't think I'm, no, this is fine. I'm gonna stick with this one. Sorry about the squeaky chair. You know, the other nice thing about a begonia in contrast to the banana trees is that those aren't plants that are really going to care if I do need to repot it in a few months, it's gonna be fine with that. Whereas something like a banana, they are more prone to just throwing an absolute fit when you pop them into a new container. Lasiocarpa, maybe not so much. It's all about how established they are in their container. So you're not doing too much damage to their roots. Looks pretty good, not really wrapped around the bottom. Maybe a little bit of wrappage, but I don't think it's very much. I can just do it, give it a little tickle. That should be plenty. Wanna make sure I have it put down far enough in here so that this winter I can really give this good drenching. Oh, I didn't mention. So this is not going to go in the ground this year. Way too small, way, way, way too small. I want this to go ahead and fill out this container during the winter time and then next year in the spring, I can put it in the ground. It's also nice with plants that are, you could say marginally hardy, although I said I'm 6B7A, there's no reason a Musilla lesiocarpa shouldn't survive in my climate, but it's a banana and they can be unpredictable sometimes <laughs> because of culture, whether or not they're seed grown and tissue cultured, all those things can play a factor into what's gonna happen with them. I think that it would be best with any plant that you're not sure about to make sure that they are very large and established when you can get them in the ground and then establish them off again once they're in the ground. And uh, then to make sure that it's early in the season so that they have multiple months to get themselves established into the ground. I said that in such a weird way, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Give them time. If I were to put this in the ground right now, it's not really going to do anything, really. It's just going to sit there until fall and then there's not much of it if there were to be damaged that it would probably just die so it doesn't have enough going on for it to keep it alive this winter this chair i got things set up so nice and then i end up in a squeaky chair i'd say the same thing for this next plant the fatsia i'm not going to be leaving that out very much this winter not like i do my bigger one because it's just a little baby and yes i'm putting the fatsia right here I'm putting that one and the no-no up into very large containers. And I know the rule of thumb, I know is one to two inches on the outside diameter, but these will be going into a grow space that's climate controlled and they will be under artificial lighting. So they shouldn't be going through a dormancy and this will just keep it going, I think longer than if I were to, kind of like with the begonia, what I was saying I should have done with the begonia is that it will give me more time in between needing to repot it. Cause with this, it would probably be fine. The banana specifically that I'll pot up next, it's just not something I want to end up needing to repot in the middle of winter when things are in the growth space. And these have pretty vigorous roots and we still have probably six to eight weeks of decent temperatures out here for it. And I'm gonna water all these in with some root and grow and they will be getting fertilized every single time they're watered in a low dosage because I'm using the fertilizer injector 
with my irrigation. So that makes a big difference too. Okay, now I'm gonna do, do the banana. You get all that plastic off of there. If it were a time of year where I was doing this inside and I didn't have all the lighting or the nice heater in the grow space, then I would be putting these into smaller containers for sure. But they still have some time outside. And like I said, they're gonna have climate control once I have them moved in. It's so little and delicate. I don't, I don't know what to do with it. My hands are confused trying to be gentle with it, but also feeling that it's nice and firm. It feels pretty sturdy. I don't really think I need to be all that gentle with it. I mean, just as gentle as you would be with any banana, but I was kind of holding it as if it were a piece of paper thin glass, which it is not. The no-no, if you don't know, is a banana that has a pinkish red variegation on it. Somewhat newer in cultivation. There's some... I don't want to say drama, maybe controversy behind it. And uh, I have yet to find solid answers to the various conspiracy theories and controversies. They have a very, very, very nice variegation on them. And they're pretty vigorous. The one that I have, pretty mad at me right now, but that's because I moved it when we had triple digit, digit, uh, triple digit temperatures. So it did what bananas do and decided that it was going to try and die on me but I got it moved back into the shade and it's looking a lot better. That was on me. And now I have a backup just in case. And the prices on these, I do think that in probably the next three to five years, if they continue, sorry about the chair, if they continue to be as vigorous as they seem to be, then I do think these will be something that's much more available commercially. I mean, if Green Escape has them and plugs, then chances are in a year or two, these will be dirt cheap. Maybe be seeing them all over the place because hot pink foliage, is something that's very popular. That's all that's left of the agaves. I think I'm zooming through this, but well, not really. Probably be zooming through it faster if I weren't talking so much, but that's kind of fun sitting down potting plants and doing chit chats. This pot right here, I really like it. I need to go drill a hole in it, so I'm gonna save that one for last. These two over here in the bottom, I'm gonna dig out a well. I have some place to set these. These are the shorter pots, which I really like. They have nice color on them. But one of them, I don't think it's this one, the wrapping on it starting to come off, which I, know, I have some opinions on that because the shorter pottery is not very cheap and I don't leave them outside during the winter time. So I just think about that and I go, well, what's the excuse there? Why are they starting to chip apart when they don't get a lot of sun? I think it's this one right here. You can kind of see where the paint the wrap that's on there starting to chip up and come off. We really shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, look at that on the inside. How it just comes up and peels off. It shouldn't be doing that. The shorter pots are not all that inexpensive. So I would expect better. I forgot that I was gonna add some more stuff into this before I put the agaves in there. So I'm gonna go grab some gravel, blend that up again and get these potted up. They good? No, back up. There we go. I'm just gonna add a whole bunch of sand. Nice fine white sugar sand remember there's already gravel in here and there's some wood chips some chunks of wood i didn't need to re-say it i think y'all know what wood chips are plenty of stuff in here for these agaves the despotianas are not an agave where i worry as much about making sure that there's incredibly super sharp drainage with them I want it to drain well and be nice and airy, but it's not like some of the more deserty <laughs> agaves like the hachensis parii's Ovatifolia, uh, even though Ovatifolia seems to be pretty good with more moist conditions than a lot of the other agaves are, because they're a more tropical agave, they can have more moisture that's held within their soil. The main thing is that in the wintertime, want it to be a soil that does dry out, because that's usually when the agaves go downhill. And I'll be keeping these agaves. They're over there. You'll see them in just a second. They'll be inside during the winter. And that's why it's gonna be even more important, right? We're not gonna have the heat and as much airflow around them. They'll have warmth, they're gonna be in my grow space. But you know what I mean? It's just not the same as being outside. So they can be more prone to rot because of that. So that's why I wanna make sure to have plenty of aeration and grit. I would add more gravel, but it turns out that little cup of lava that I put in here was all that I had. So I won't be potting up the other agave, the Ovatifolia. I want that to have some more grit as far as gravel pieces go in the blend. But for these guys, this should be fine. Can you see it? I can zoom in a little bit. 
That was too much. Come on, bring it down here. Look at that. That's a nice sandy blend. It's not falling apart too quickly, but it should hold on to some moisture still. <laughs> okay, here we go. Back it up, yeah. I think they should be good with that. So anyways, as I was saying with these shorter containers, sure, oh, these aren't even shorter, it's Shurich. So I had that wrong. Well, I think, what is shorter? Is that a, a self-watering container brand? I can't remember, I know shorter is something. Is it orchids? I don't remember, but Shurich, popular brand, but I'm disappointed with, what has it been, three, four years I've had these containers and they're already starting to crumble up. I feel like that shouldn't be happening. So these are the Galactic Traveler agaves, and I think that they'll look very nice with this green, the lime green on those pots. Isn't that a beautiful agave? So pretty. It's a very, it's very soft blue, has some sparkle and shine to it, which you do not see on agaves very often, especially variegated agaves. I'll make sure that's up there at the right height. I think that should be good. Roots on these look like they aren't in a place where I should need to pull at them or tear at them. I think that just getting it in there should be all that I need to do. Not much to it. Just gonna fill these in and give them a drink and move on. Okay, and the last one is the Joe Hoke. I think you guys, I didn't need to show you potting up both of those, did I? It's the same plant. I think that would have been annoying and redundant. This one right here was in the most recent plant haul. The name on it is Joe Hoke, like I said, and it has a much more delicate, light variegation to it. And you can see, like, look at that leaf right here. Isn't that pretty? It's like soft blue, I just got dirt all over it. Soft blues and greens and creams, no harsh yellows. It's just a nice, calm variegation, which I love. And I am pretty excited to put it into this container. I've had this pot, I don't even know, probably three to five years, maybe longer than that. And I've yet to put anything in it because I just keep forgetting that I need to drill holes in the bottom. So I grabbed my bit and I popped three holes down there. That should be ample. I thought about doing another two, but I didn't want to mess the integrity of the base of the pot up too much. That in my hand was getting tired <laughs> holding the drill. The bit that I was using, I think is getting kind of old. It was taking me a pretty long time to get those three holes drilled. It must be time to replace that diamond bit. If you don't know, drilling holes in pottery, very, 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 very simple. Just need a diamond bit and have some water, ideally water that's running over where you're drilling the hole and you just slowly drill the hole. Sometimes it's helpful to put a piece of masking tape where you want to drill your hole because it can help hold the bit in place. They like to slide and swirl all over the place when you start to press down. But once you get a little indentation made, it's fairly easy to hold it in place. I usually apply a light pressure and then ease up light pressure and ease up so that the water can move all the little grit bits out of the way so you can get a cleaner cut and a faster cut that way. But uh, you don't have to do that. This is going to be able to be in this container for a very long time. This was, oh man, look at those roots. That thing was ready for a repot. That's so, so, so root bound. Do I need to do much with it? I just watered this and it's already dry too. That's not surprising considering what it looks like. I'm just going to tickle it. I'm not going to do any tearing. Some of these aren't even alive. Some of those are dead roots, but that's okay. Just want to make sure that things aren't moving in too much of a circular pattern. Slight circular pattern is okay, but don't want it to be too much. Want to make sure that this root zone will blend in with that new potting mix is. If not, then this is all completely pointless. Yeah. Look at that. This is going to be so beautiful when that it won't even take that long. I would bet by the time I'm, I'm moving these inside, that should have some really nice growth on it, or at the very least just look more hydrated and open. All three of these, I would like to top dress with some gravel. I just don't have any right now, but um, you know, got in the back of my mind. I'll remember next time I'm out, probably the beach pebbles, some dark stone to go on top. I think that would look really, really good. I am so glad to have that done and really glad to if I only use this pot. I think that the variegation on this one and the shape of that being a Desmentiana, it's an agave that you can't really see it right now, but the leaves will eventually start to come up and arch more and somewhat hang down at the ends. That's going to look really nice in that container. Yeah. Okay. This is a squeaky chair. Need to oil the chair. All done. Going to water these in. I think that I need to charge a new battery for that thing, but whenever the new battery is charged up, Go over into the shade garden and start popping plants in the ground. Oh, 
Oh, there was just drama, Kitten and Pumpkin. You told her what's up, didn't you, Pumpkin? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'll leave you alone. I know, you were sleeping. And the kitten came in and kitten iced you. Hey, Turbo. Came inside to get batteries for the drill. And then, you know, when you see, saw it, animal things happened. Oh, uh, and the microphones. Had to charge the microphones. Everything needs charging right now. Oh, and quick rant. Where's all the color? Look, what are we doing here? We're dragging the dystopian, everything's washed out, has no color look into baby stuff too? Not a fan. <sighs> okay, rant over. Here's what's going on. I have everything loaded up into the gorilla cart, and I'm mostly ready to plant. I'm just debating if I should. There's not going... This, what you're going to see isn't going to be like a dramatic before and after. These are all very small plants. And there are some shrubs I've been trying to find that I can't find, and I think it would make a big difference if I were to plant those at the same time. But I also just like to get this done, so I think I'm just going to get this done and then add the shrubs later. So it won't have as dramatic of a before and after because the shrubbery is what's going to make a big difference. But this is something. It's mostly just going to look like little random plants stuck in a big bed of mulch because that's what it is. That's okay. The ferns got really dry today. I gave them a water and they're still all crispy. Look at that. I normally would say water them before getting them in the ground, but I watered them. So I think that I really just need to get them into the ground. Okay. Want the pack of Sandra down here as close to the edge as possible. I would like for that to start to form a shield over here. Actually, maybe more like around that corner. Might be good. Start to get some ground cover to fill in. Help hold back the weeds. Toad lily. I originally wanted by the bird bath. I'm thinking I'm going to move the bird bath, which is going to require assistance. That's why it's not happening right now. So, oh, should I not be doing the metal area until I move? I probably should hold off on anything that goes in there, shouldn't I? Crap. Eh, I don't want to wait. I can always move it in the springtime. I want the toad lily over here. I want to see those flowers. They're so pretty. Holly fern underneath the magnolia. Cause it's going to look at, it's going to provide so much shade for it. <laughs> That's a thing that I didn't think about that in the winter, it's an evergreen fern. So when there aren't any leaves on this tree, that thing's going to get some sun. Someday the magnolia will be bigger and it won't be a problem, but that's not going to be for a while. The royal fern I want nestled over there. Rodea I want over here. A very dark spot that the sprinklers don't hit. And I think that that's pretty much the only thing that will grow over here, more than likely. Hakanakloa. I wanted this at the base of the bird bath, but the bird bath is what's being moved. But wouldn't that be pretty? Is that grass coming out from the front of there? Ain't that look really nice? I had also thought that it would look good over here too. So you have the Pachysandra and some other things that will go over here at some point and have that kind of pilling out. I do like the Hakana Kloa to be more where there's a slope. There's a good slope there. So I think that'll work out. Ginger Asarum. Right there. Hardy begonia. So this is just a trial plant, so I'm just dropping that in the ground right there. This year I'll put a better variety in next year. This one, the saxifraga. I love this. Such nice leaves. The saxifraga. One right there, right in the front. Standing tall, podophyllum. Back there towards the tree, 42 inches tall. That needs to be fairly far back there. I want the Diform Podophyllum over here, eh, maybe over here. It was basically the same thing. I didn't need to make that correction. And what's left? Voodoo lilies. Well, nothing to see there. Okay. Everything's placed for the most part right where I want them to be. I'm just going to get these popped in the ground and we'll come right back. Huh? Well, <laughs> what do we think? I know. Like I said, there's not going to be a dramatic before and after. They're little guys. Everything needs time to fill out. And they're pretty much where I said I was going to put all of them. I shifted some things around a smidge. Is this, is this going to be a problem? Is that what you're going to do, Turbo? Okay, good boy. Yeah, oops. front and center. That's good. We need a little bit of eye candy. Good boy, Turbo. I don't even remember what I was saying. <laughs> I got so distracted by Turbo. Uh, I shifted some things around a smidge. I had the ginger basically right where Turbo was. This is a path. It's not much of a path, but it is a path. It's a shortcut to come back over to the side of the yard so I don't want anything planted and basically right where Turbo is. 
So I just moved it over. It's an evergreen, so that's going to fill up very nicely. Look at that foliage. So pretty. Such nice, shiny foliage. The royal fern, which is incredibly mad at me right now, have that back further towards the tree. That one potentially can get up to five feet, so that needed to be towards the middle. The middle is where the height is going to be in here, as you can see from all the height in the middle right now. Smaller things towards the front. You get how it goes, right? Ground covers, mid-level, third level, and then trees and structure. Bind everything else. The Hakena Chloa. I had it over there. I realized that that's probably going to be too much sun. So I put it over here and uh, I remember that this is actually where I originally had wanted the Hakena Chloa. I would like to have a few more of them. One here, one here, and probably one up there. So there's a big just hill of them. It's hard to tell. But this is There's a pretty heavy slope right here that eventually I'll be putting a rock wall or a brick wall that matches the rest of the Windsor stone that's out here. And I think that'll look really nice. For now, I, I only have the one. So that's where... That's where it's getting started. Uh, the Korean tassel fern underneath the magnolia that will fill out over time. The magnolia, of course, will fill out over time too. The like 10 year, maybe five year plan here is that once this magnolia has, I'd say quadrupled the size, the maple tree is going to go because the maple tree is way too close to the house. I'm going to have issues eventually with the foundation or sewer stuff at some point. It's probably only about 15 feet from the foundation. So that's not going to work there long term. It's going to have to go, which is also why the only things I'm planting around the maple really close to it right now are things that I can easily dig up and move and I don't think will be destroyed. Like the roeo on the other side, roeia, rhodia. <laughs> I'm thinking of oyster plants, the rhodia on the other side. Easy to lift them and store them if you have to and you can get them back in the ground. They're really tough plants. The fern, it's not a really fancy fern, but the royal ferns tend to be pretty sturdy and shallow rooted so you can lift them up move them without much of an issue but uh, those aren't things I really need to be worried about for a few more years but eventually this will be much taller have the Korean tassel fern behind it and then shorter some sort of ground cover in the front maybe some of the saxifraga on the other side uh, I would like to have multiple forms of ground covers in this area since I just I love ground cover and a lot of it like shade so I finally have a spot to play around with some of that this whole middle area is still pretty open and that's because, well, shrubbery, right? I would like to put uh, maybe one, two, three shrubs in here, some sort of evergreen, just haven't picked them out yet. I know what I want, I'm just having trouble finding them. Moving down from there though, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to see it. There's a white tag there, another white tag over there, and the other one that I thought I had up high enough has disappeared. Those are the voodoo lilies. So <laughs> eventually, <laughs> he's really into the camera today. Don't eat that, don't eat that. It's cute and you sniff the flowers, but don't eat it. Eventually, there will be a single leaf that comes up from each one. The leaves look like little trees, so it's a stalk with what looks like a hand, sort of. I don't really know how to describe it. Those can be three to four feet tall, and then once these have been in the ground for about three to four years, they should produce very tall flowers, up to five feet tall, that smell horrible. Uh, so that's why they're a little bit downwind from everything, but they're really neat to see. Uh, oh, there's the other tag. It's right there. It was just at an angle. It was hard to see. So one, two, three with those voodoo lilies. They will multiply over time too. So by the time these are big enough to flower, each one of these should have put up probably two or three more plants alongside of it. So there'll be a nice drift here of those really big exotic tropical looking leaves. He's so cute there, Turbo. What you doing? Taking all the attention. Coming down front, I moved the uh, Pakistaki, no, Pakistander, not Pakistakis, headed over there. Moved it into this corner. They can take a lot of sun and like right around here, this area does actually get a good amount of sun. That's why I wanted this here. I figured this would be a good plant to have just fill in that area. They're semi-evergreen here. It just depends on the winter. They are sturdy, tough plants. Look at those leaves. I think Pakistander has some of the prettiest leaves and they flower. It's not much to the flowers, but they do flower. So I'm gonna have a patch of color down there. Look at all the space I still have to work with with various ground covers and perennials. There's still so much room to work with in here. The toad lily, have that back further back so you know there's room to play with things in the front with the hardy begonia next to it nothing's really doing anything yet but i think you're starting to see the vision here hopefully maybe i don't know everything's just it's just a dot right give it time the acanthus is finally starting to respond and <laughs> starting to put up mature leaves now that it's almost fall but that's okay so hopefully next year there'll be two or three times the size great big shiny leaves right there with the toad lily behind it have a Typhonium giganteum over here. I accidentally knocked around with my foot earlier. Another beautiful type of voodoo lily. Big tropical leaves. That begonia, it'll pop back up. That's a hardy begonia that only goes 24 inches tall. There are other varieties that I like better. 
I just couldn't get a hold of them for this year that it will grow about three feet tall. That I think would be really pretty back there and they have really pretty peduncles, dangling pink flowers. And then over here, this is where it looks like there's not much to see, but someday there will be. <laughs> it's just stuff that's very dramatic, but doesn't look dramatic yet. So the standing tall podophyllum, this right here is gonna go about 42 inches tall. So it's gonna be way up here. There's just leaves like that right up there. Nice, big and tall. They have a pretty round, compact shape to them. So it's not something that should spread or take over the area. With the more exotic diform podophyllum down here, that has, uh, it doesn't have it yet, but as it matures, those leaves will go up to 20 inches tall. And the foliage is it's almost like an aqua with a purple overlay. It's a really, really neat looking leaf. Think of like a giant cyclamen leaf and shaped oddly. Like here's a one that has its mature shape to it, but not its mature color. Really cool foliage on that one. And then the saxifraga, I plopped down right here in the front because I figure it's probably gonna be the most sturdy ground cover that I can find. And this is area that has a lot of traffic, not the most sturdy ground cover I can find, the most sturdy of the three that I'm playing with right now, because I know that the dogs, it's, it's an area that's gonna get some trampling and it's slightly more protected over here. Not that it needs it, because these are hardy, I believe to zone three, but I, it will help them maintain that evergreenness. And this is one where if I wanna move it, I can just pick it right up and move it, no problem, which is good because the bird bath, well, one, it needs to be re-leveled and I'm thinking about lifting it up completely and maybe putting a base underneath it with some stone that goes all the way around it so it'll look kind of like a fountain but not be a fountain and that way it will be easier to maintain and mulch around it without it slowly getting buried over time like it is right now and uh, the allspice is just sitting there it's been too hot to plant up until today so I need to just I, I haven't gotten around to it but it'll get planted soon yeah it's just the beginning and I'm pretty excited about it I've been working on this planting out for such a long time all the little babies I'm gonna be keeping everything watered heavily every single day rain or shine they're getting watered for the next three to four weeks and then uh, it'll be fall at that point and they can go off into a dormancy but it's really important that they never become dehydrated at this time and tomorrow and probably next monday maybe next tuesday i'll be watering everything with root and grow so I want to get them started off with a rooting fertilizer, but I don't want to go too hard with it because, you know, fall's coming up too. But just a little something to help get them moving and going. Oh, wow, it feels good to have that done. Been working on that area for such a long time in little increments, but it's you know, one of those things where the project's been in the back of my mind. Not much left to plant over here. The things that are left are things that aren't for the shade garden anyways. Just a few gingers, that's it. Made a big dent in... It's going to be so nice every time I'm walking down there. I, I've just, I've always wanted a garden space where you can look at it from all three sides, ideally four sides if you have a little island. All the beds I've ever had have always been up against the house and they're very narrow. I kind of have a garden bed down here. You could say where those laurels are, but not really because I never go to that side of the yard on the other side of the laurel. So planting it up would be pretty pointless. Whereas this, this is an area where you walk down and into it and you're like, oh, look, there's plants on each side of me. You can go down around it and look at it from all the different sides and there's a path that'll come up through there. I love that, it's a, a true garden bed. And for the most part, everything that's in there is fairly unusual. The tassel fern's a pretty basic fern. Nothing unusual about that, but everything else are plants that are common, but there's something just a little bit different about them or they're special hybrids like those podophyllums. And uh, the, what is it, the saxifraga. Just sneezed right on my foot, that was rude. Also, my feet are covered in dirt. Forgot how messy the auger is when you're working in soil. With the soil in these beds over here, it's, I don't know, it's more, it's not dense, that's not the right word. It's a dark, rich soil. Everything over there is very light and uh, sandy almost. If that's, I don't know, that's, it's not sandy, it's just, it disperses more with the auger. That's the whole point there. It flies around. It gets you. I got some in my eye because I didn't have my glasses on. That was dumb. I put my glasses on after that. That was fun. I'm looking forward to getting some more stuff planted over there, but I'm for now very happy to have even just gotten this done, which I know you can't see it. Someday it'll be, you know, standing over here and go, oh, look at this, look at this. And you'll be able to see that there's a garden bed back there. That's fun. That's exciting. All right. This has been fun. Got some good stuff done. Made a big dent with the drip. Good kind of dent, the kind of dent that makes my life easier. A bunch of stuff repotted over here. I didn't get to show you how the yuccas are looking. They're not yuccas, agaves. They're already starting to perk up. It didn't take much. Yeah, not much, but they're looking better. Orchids got a little bit of bleaching on them. 
I don't, uh, it was just so hot. They didn't get a lot of sun, but it just doesn't take much when you're looking at triple digit temperatures. So they'll be okay. I mean, the flowers will be fine. Eventually the plants will need to be cut back and probably started over, but that's not the end of the world. All the fun little stuff down here. Looking forward to watching all that grow. All right, hope everybody's doing well. Having a great day, a great life. Everything's just going absolutely beautifully for you. You good boy, yes you are, touching a turbo. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye. Bye.